Hi everyone, this video is introduction to solid principles and how the need to learn these principles arise as we grow as a software engineer along with our project. So let's get started. Before moving on to these core principles, let's have a look at some of the problems which exist with existing software development process and what happens if we don't align our code with respect to these principles. Software starts to rot. What does this mean? Well, in the process of software development, no software is static in nature. It is continuously changing and evolving as we keep on adding new features to it. And things start to go wrong when we start making changes to our software due to feature requests from our customers. Why is that? Because any change you do to the software induces a chance of two things, breaking an existing functionality and increasing the complexity of the code. Now, if we don't learn how to make changes to an existing software correctly, as the time goes by, it will become very difficult to maintain the software. And eventually, it will take a huge amount of efforts just to make simple changes to the software and making sure everything works as expected. Okay, let's have a look at a few design smells in the software which starts to degrade the quality of code written over time. If you see these problems with the code you are handling, then you can be sure that it is not aligning to the principles and the doomsday is near. The first thing, if the code is difficult to understand at first sight, this is a very early indication that things are going in the wrong direction. A program with well written clean code is very easy to understand. And I'll show you this in my later videos by taking a bad example and aligning it to these solid principles one by one. Don't worry. If you're trying to do a refactoring exercise and you're finding it very difficult to reuse pieces of code, it's one more indication that the code is not following solid principles. Now, to the more serious implications, rigidity and fragility. Rigidity means that every change requires a lot of effort and a lot of hardwiring to be executed and fragility means that change at one place can cause some other feature to be broken which you might be completely unaware of. Trust me, you don't want to be at this place but if you are then you are at the right place because this series will help you learn exactly the concepts you need to make the code better. So here I present the principles which can help you save your dying project. Drum roll the solid principles. Let's call out each principle by its name and we will study each one of them in detail in its separate video. S is for the single responsibility principle. O goes for open closed principle. L is for Liskov substitution principle. I is for interface segregation principle. And D is for dependency inversion principle. Well, that is some introductory background knowledge you should be knowing for diving deep in solid principles. Let's move on to the principles one by one. All right, so see you in the next video. In the last lecture, we went through the introductory concepts for solid principles. In this video, we will study single responsibility principle. Single responsibility principles definition is very simple and is inherent from the definition itself. A class should have only one responsibility. And what's a responsibility? Well, it is defined as a reason to change. And yeah, that's it. That's your single responsibility principle. Simple, isn't it? Well, not at all. Single responsibility is the most powerful principle and it's very important that you understand it very well. And to do so, you would need to understand what are the reasons for which a class can change or how to find the number of reasons there are in a class due to which it can change. So let's have a look at what a change is. A change can be defined as an alteration in behavior and if we are talking with respect to class, the methods of the class represents its behavior. Now this does not in any way mean that the number of methods in a class is equal to the number of reasons a class might have to change. Now that you know what a change is, there could be a big change, I mean where you add a lot of code for your wonderful feature or it could be a small change or a breaking change. And trust me, a breaking change is capable of getting you fired in the worst case. 
So let's move on to an example to understand this better. Let's say you have this awesome web calculation engine which can take two numbers from you and perform some operation like add, subtract, multiply or divide. Let's say this was the version 1 for your application and now you want to add new features for this awesome app. Let me ask you something. Can you be 100% sure that your change for the new feature is not going to break the older features? If yes, then congrats. If no, then keep watching. I have attached some sample code for the addition feature for this app. Can you identify how many reasons does this class has to change? You can pause the video and try to figure that out. Okay, I'm sorry if this was the first time someone asked you to look at the code and identify the reasons for it to change. If you have found a few, then that's great. If not, let's do a deep dive. So, according to me, if you add new features to this app, following are the reasons due to which this class would need changes for. If you make any change to the add method, or if you need to change the subtract method, or let's say you want to add a completely new category of numbers, which is complex number, and you want to support addition for complex numbers as well. So in that case also, this class will require changes because if you see the addition method which is implemented in this class, it has a lot of responsibilities. It has a lot to take care of. It, it has to take care of integer numbers. It has to take care of decimal numbers. It has to take care of big integers. And if, 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 if you try to add new features to this method, such as complex numbers, you risk breaking the existing functionalities which the method was already doing. Okay. Now, if you add any more methods, let's say multiply or divide or something like that, that re still requires your calculator class to change because you will be modifying this class. And trust me, whenever there is a need for modification, there is a risk involved. Well, now you see why this class is not following the single responsibility principle because this class has five reasons to change. Maybe more if you add multiply and division features. Let's see what we can do to make this class SRP compliant. And here we have given only one responsibility to the calculator and it's the responsibility of delegation. The calculator acts as an interface for its clients where they can supply their input and the operation they want to execute. If you look closely, calculator is not doing any number validation type checking or even performing any addition or subtraction. You might argue that this is same as the previous one, but this is not the case. In the previous example, this class had a lot of reason to change as mentioned in the previous slide. Whereas in this case, it has only one reason which is handling delegation for a class of expression. Even if you add an additional method for ternary expression, the responsibility of the class remains same as this won't increase the number of reasons for the class to change. Okay, let's again have a look at the previous code. Do you really think that it's the calculator's responsibility to perform the actual addition? I mean, on a higher level it is, but if you dive deep, your calculator doesn't add the numbers. It just takes your input and has a way to display the results. It is just an interface the actual addition happens inside the IC or the chip, which means it's not the calculator's responsibility to add numbers. And clearly in our code, we are violating it by giving it too many responsibilities than it can handle. And that is why I took out those additional responsibilities from that class and gave it something which it can handle and what it should be supposed to use for, which is delegation of the input and the operation. Well, let's have a look at how can we decide if my class is SRP compliant or not. And this depends on a couple of things. Let's say, if you are really looking at classes which are really, really big, like more than 1000 lines or let's say 600 lines, or you're looking at some really large methods, like methods having more than 50 plus or 60 plus lines, then these are clear indication that these methods or classes are not following the single responsibility principle. You can also look for methods which have too many parameters. Now, 
how many is too many so ideally if you are constantly seeing methods which have more than four or five parameters then those many arguments fall into the too many category also try writing a unit test for the class or the method you are testing or you are trying to see if that's a SRP compliant class or a method or not if, if, if you are finding it very difficult to write a unit test for that method then it's a very good indication that this class or a method is not following the single responsibility principle you know, what can you do to make it compliant well the most simple thing that you can do to make your class SRP compliant is that if you can name it in a better way other than that it really depends on your ability to group similar kind of behavior together and this will require some practice but if you keep looking for it you will get better at it along with that if you can solve the other three problems which I mentioned before like really large classes really large methods try refactoring those classes to smaller classes try refactoring those methods to smaller methods try reducing the number of parameters to a method and try try writing a unit test for it the process of writing the unit test itself will make you refactor the code such that it becomes more compliant to the single responsibility principle also assuming that you are following good naming practices where your method name reflects what the method does if your classes or method names have really large names like bake and serve and collect bill that's a clear indication that you are doing more than one thing if your if your methods or class names include some conjunctions which are connecting two different actions or maybe three different actions then that's a very clear indication that you are violating the SRP principle there now one most important point is that do not confuse more responsibilities with a method or a class having multiple dependencies which they are calling to get the job done for example have a look at this code this method doesn't have three reasons to change you may argue that there's three but that's not correct think about it this way what is the responsibility for my responsible class in this example it acts as a backbone for other dependencies to execute a unit of work its responsibility is to orchestrate it is like the nervous system for the program but again don't add too many orchestrations such that it becomes like a god class that's again a coding spell so keep your class size in check so that it doesn't become a god class doing everything so let's have a look at common responsibilities for a class a class can be an action taker or a delegator or an orchestrator if you look at the slide in our previous example the class my responsible class is an orchestrator as its responsibility is to orchestrate whereas dependency 1 2 and 3 are more often action takers a delegator is a class which acts as a proxy to another class and you can watch my video on the proxy design pattern to learn more about it link in the description the responsibility of a class doesn't depend on the number of methods in the class as I have said before if you observe closely I have just changed the name of the class and the number of responsibility reduces to one in the initial example the the class is named as file uploader and what this name reflects is that this class will have a responsibility to upload something now when I add a download file method to this class the actions of this class and the name of this class do not match with each other the action clearly says that this class is doing two things whereas the name suggests that it, it's only responsible for the uploading part but see I have just changed the name from file uploader to file network IO gateway now this is a more interesting name for the class as it describes more about what the class is responsible for and just by changing the name we are able to group these two methods under one responsibility so now let's have a look at what should you do if you are creating a new class or refactoring an older one try to think of good names for your class which can represent what the methods in your class are doing collectively try to put the cohesive methods closer to each other and try avoiding long and descriptive names which contain conjunctions like and 
try to avoid a butterfly effect between your methods as you saw in the example where the subtract method was calling the addition method and any bugs which are there in the addition method will also break the subtract functionality so this is what it's called butterfly effect you make a change somewhere and some other feature breaks you can also list down all the methods in the class along with the class name and see if it makes sense for all the methods to be there once you find that a class have more than one reason to change extract those additional reasons out in a separate class well srp is not only applicable on classes and methods you can also apply it on a package level or over a module level itself always remember responsibilities can be big or small but it should be one okay so now let's have a look at some advantages of single responsibility principle if your code is following single responsibility your code will be less fragile you can test it easily your dependency will be very loosely coupled and it will be very easy to debug your code the most important advantage which is my favorite as well is that you will be able to implement a pluggable architecture because srp really allows you to build your code like a plugin based model where your code is so much clean that you can just swap out any dependency and everything works as expected if you're really able to master the single responsibility principle your code will start looking like a jigsaw puzzle and that's a very good thing imagine each piece having one and only one responsibility that's how your classes should be crisp and clean doing one thing with extreme excellence how to keep single responsibility in check start learning design patterns it really allows you to restructure your code in a very clean way also learn refactoring principles it will also allow you to keep your coding quality in check on an overall basis you can also go for test driven development because writing unit tests for your code actually helps you to basically remove additional responsibilities out of the class and it's very easy to test a class which only has one responsibility at last you can also read code written by other people and you will get a fair enough idea how the single responsibility principle works that's my take on helping you understand single responsibility principle if you have any doubts let me know in the comments otherwise till we meet for the next time goodbye hi and welcome everyone in this video we are going to demystify the o in the solid principles which is also called open close principle let's have a look at the definition first by definition a class should be open for extension and closed for modification when applied well further changes of that kind are achieved by adding new code not by changing old code which already works note a very important detail here code changes of similar kind let's break the definition into two separate parts and try to understand them one by one the first one says classes should be open for extension this means that you model your features in such a way which requires you to define a clear contract and you stick to it this requires a lot of thought before implementation once the contract is clear this is exposed by an interface or an abstract class and not the concrete implementation this is done this way because it allows you to provide a different implementation for the interface which allows you to dynamically change functionality at runtime i call this art isn't it beautiful the second one says closed for modification this is pretty straightforward the concrete classes you have created in the first part you don't modify them at all because to achieve new functionality you can just create a new class for the similar separate feature also this is only applicable when you want to add a similar kind of feature if you have foreseen this you can create an interface at the first go itself but that violates yagni principle which says you are gonna need it but you can take a decision after reading your requirement specifications for your feature also there are scenarios when you need to add more methods to the existing contract now this is a little tricky because it does and also does not violate the open close principle at the same time let's see how if you add more methods to your interface contract you are breaking all the existing implementation of classes you have implemented before because you need to provide a functionality for the new methods in those classes this is not a problem if your implementation classes are living in the same code base 
But the problem arises when your implementation classes are living outside the module or the project itself. Those will break when you update your contract. So to overcome this, Java has a feature to add new methods to the interface and still keep older classes from breaking. And this is done by providing default methods to the interface. I'm sure other languages will also have something similar to this. This allows your interface to be backward compatible. So in this case, as long as you're not breaking the existing contract with the older version of interface, the open close principle is not violated. Let's have a look at how the code looks without the open close principle. The left side of the image shows a graphical representation of the older version of code. And what happens when you try to add new feature or similar type of feature to your existing code? You merge these together at one place and this violates two principles. The single responsibility principle, since now your method is doing more than one thing, and the open close principle, because you just modified your class to achieve a similar type of code. And this leads room for more modifications in future if similar requests come again. So let's see how we can do this better. Here we have the same example, but this time we have taken a different route to implement this feature. Instead of adding code for new similar feature in the same method, I have created an interface for the client which the client can talk to. And based on the type of argument, we can use polymorphism or some dependency injector like Spring to inject the correct dependency and get the concrete implementation of the required subclass. This way, if any future request with similar kind of feature is required, then you can just add a new class for it and do not need to edit the older ones. This is following benefits. You don't have to modify your old unit tests since your old code didn't change at all. You're free for adding any new feature just by adding a separate class. Again, see, we are not modifying, editing or deleting an existing class to achieve something new. We're just adding. So here are some advantages of open close principle. Your old unit test cases don't need changes. Writing unit tests for your new code is very simple because you just need to add a separate test class for your unit test. This also helps you achieve single responsibility principle as now you're breaking the functionality into separate classes and each functionality sits in its own class. So every class has one responsibility. This also opens a way for Liskov substitution principle to be implemented and we'll talk about that in a later video. Similarly, it also opens up the way for interface segregation principle and dependency inversion principle. And we will see those as well in later videos. So I wish you believe that it's a very powerful concept and can save you a lot of headache while programming and writing tests. That's all I had on open close principle. Goodbye. Hi and welcome everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss the Liskov substitution principle. Let's get started with the definition. For Liskov substitution principle, Subtypes must be substitutable with their base types. Now, in the world of object-oriented programming, we create classes for different entities and use inheritance among classes to describe a is a relationship. What the scope substitution principle says is that whenever you are creating a class hierarchy, the clients which are expecting a version of your base class to work with, if they are given a subclass instead, they should be able to get their work done without caring about whether the implementation they got was a base class or a derived class. If we have created a subclass which cannot be used in place of its base class, then that subclass is violating the Liskov substitution principle. Let's have a look at a couple of examples for LSP violation. So we are taking this shapes example. Here we have a base class called shape, which provides an interface for a client to draw a shape by passing an instance of shape class. Now, shape has two subclasses. We have a circle and a square. Okay, let's have a look at the draw shape method. If you observe closely, there's an open close principle violation as this method is explicitly checking for what shape instance it is getting and then calling the particular draw method for that particular class. The problem is that this method needs to be modified whenever there is a new class which is added to the shape hierarchy. Hence, this is not closed for modification, thus violating the open close principle. Interesting, isn't it? Let's have a look at how LSP is getting violated. 
let's say we have a third subclass for a shape category called triangle. Think about what happens if client passes a triangle object to the draw shape method. What is the client expectation? A triangle on the screen, but what happens? Nothing. Which makes us think that triangle subclass is not substitutable in place of shape, which is the base class for the current method, thus violating the Liskov substitution principle. Let's have a look at another example. We have a base class called rectangle with two methods, set width and set height. And we have a derived class called square. Notice that the client is trying to interact with the base class and expects the base class as an argument. According to Liskov substitution principle, a subclass should be substitutable in place of base class. So let's see what happens when we try to pass a square. So after a square is passed, this method calls the set width method on the base class. And what happens is that the width is updated to 12. Think about this for a minute. Is this correct? If you observe now, you have square with uneven sides. That's not correct. Again, you see that you cannot pass a square in place of a rectangle. So these two classes are violating this of substitution principle. Let's see how we can fix this. If we add an override annotation to the methods in the derived class, now if you look at the previous example, if the client wants to call the set width method, even when the square is passed, the square remains intact. But look closely. You might be thinking that by now we have solved the LSP violation problem. But look at the new problem which arises. Client is expecting a rectangle and it set its height and width and tries to calculate the area. Whenever a rectangle is passed for this method, things are well. But what happens if you pass a square instead? With the new implementation, your method does not return the expected result. Why is that so? Since you are calling the set height and set width method not on a rectangle, but which is a square which is wrapped inside a rectangle as a subclass, when you call the set width method with the value 4, it also updates its height with value 4. And hence, when you try to get the area, you don't get it as 20, which is expected, but you get it as 16, which is 4 into 4. Now, with this new implementation, your method does not return the expected result. And you see how the square class is not substitutable in place of a rectangle. Hence, these two classes are violating the scope substitution principle. Do you see what the problem is? Even though you feel that a square is a rectangle, the design itself is incorrect because pragmatically, these two are not substitutable with each other. What is really happening in the two examples we have discussed so far is that if you observe closely, what the subclasses are doing to the client expectation is that they are causing some subtle side effects to the output. Like in case of square and rectangle, where set width did not update the height of the square and get area returned the incorrect area in case of a square. We should make sure that subclasses should be substitutable in place of base class and to achieve this we should always check that we are not violating any preconditions or post conditions for the base class which are causing the side effects let's see why the is a relationship is not working as expected even though we thought that a square is a rectangle we were not able to substitute it so let's see why whenever you try to think from an object's perspective you might think that it is sufficient but whenever you view something in isolation it might seem correct you should not view something in isolation or some classes in isolation what you should do is look at how the client is going to use that for that you should design a contract now this is where the lsp connects to the ocp principle in open closed principle we discussed that the classes should be open for extension and closed for modification. So here, if you have designed a contract for your client, then you have already solved one part of the problem. But Liskov substitution principle helps you to solve the other part of the problem where you supply new subclasses for extending the behavior of the code. You should do that in a way that does not have any side effects with respect 
to the contract you have defined. Lastly, to keep your classes in check, you should add unit tests to keep track of all the pre and post conditions associated with your base class, which might or might not violate the contract. Okay, let's have a look at this more generic example to understand LSP. Let's say you are the client and your job is to reach the destination and you're using an app which allows you to book a vehicle and get your job done, which is to help you reach your destination. Now think closely. If you only care about reaching the destination, it doesn't really matter that you are taken by a car or motorbike or a helicopter as long as you reach safely. Now this is where Liskop substitution principle is in action. For this job, all the subclasses of the base class vehicle are capable of taking you to the destination, which means no matter which vehicle you substitute, your job is done. And in programming, the client class only cares about one thing, getting its job done through the dependency, no matter what the internal subclass implementation is doing that task. It simply does not care. As long as you are getting the job done, it's fine. Here are a few examples which can help you avoid Liskop substitution principle. The first one is to stick to your contract and make sure that you don't create side effects as you have seen how these could affect badly your client's expectation. The second one is avoid degenerate functions. You might have seen your code where you provide an implementation for a method in the base class but keep the same method in the subclass empty. That can cause risk of substitution violation since now you cannot use your subclass in place of base class. Third, if the user of base class don't expect any exceptions from the base class implementation, you should not throw any exceptions from the subclass implementation as well, as this would create uneven behavior. Lastly, avoid thinking on grounds of is or inheritance a relationship. Think on grounds of is it substitutable for its client in place of base class. This will allow you to think more from the contract perspective rather than from the object perspective. Okay, now, I hope that you have gotten a clear enough idea about what Liskov substitution principle is and what are some subtle conditions you should look for so that you don't violate it. And that's all with the Liskov substitution principle and I will see you in the next video. Hi everyone. In this video, we will discuss the interface segregation principle. So what does this principle say? Well, according to interface segregation principle, Clients should not be forced to depend on method they do not use. Let's try to understand this with a very simple example first, and then we will do one more example to dive deep. So in this example, let's say we were modeling a planet where living things lives. So we have an interface called a living thing, which can breathe and walk. Now, anything which moves and breathes, we call it a living thing. I have taken human class uh, in this example, but let's assume that we have many like human, fish, etc. Now, what if we want to also model trees? In fact, they are also alive. So they should fall under the living things category. So what do we do? We go ahead and make trees implement living things and keep the walk implementation intentionally empty. So what kind of violation can you observe in this example? If we go backwards, we see a violation of Liskov substitution principle because trees cannot be used in place of base class living thing among clients which call the walk method. Also, we see OCP violation because we would need to explicitly check for tree implementation and provide a different logic for execution. And this will happen with every other living thing implementation which has a method which is intentionally left empty because it does not belong there. And that's what ISP is about. Clients should not be forced to depend on methods they do not use. Okay, so let's move on to an, another example. But for this current example, which I just showed you, I am not going to give you this solution for the violation. I want you to understand the second example and use the knowledge to find the solution for this one. So I request you to come back at this example after you have understood the second one. Consider this as an exercise. So moving on to the next example, 
we had a requirement which started with this. We had to model doors which had the ability to open and close. So we created this door interface which had these two methods and started implementing this in the subclass. So that these two methods were there with them. So far, so good. Let's add something more to the requirements. Let's say we want to add a timed door to our application, which sounds an alarm when it is kept open for too long and then it closes automatically. What are our options? The first thought which comes to our mind is that since it is a door, we will add a timeout method in the door interface and create a timed door implementation for the same as shown here in this picture. This fulfills our requirement, but what is wrong here? The problem is that even though wooden door and sliding door do not have any timer feature, they would need to implement the timeout method since it is part of the door interface now. And this causes the violation for interface segregation principle because it says clients should not be forced to depend on methods they do not use. So what's the best way to look for this? So the best way to look for this kind of violation is to look for this particular scenario. And that's pretty good. Now you know how it gets violated, but how do we fix it? Let's have a look. We are going to look at two different ways to solve this problem. The first one is using the adapter pattern and the second one is using multiple inheritance. Instead of adding this timeout method in the door interface, we add it in the timed door adapter. So now timed door creates a timed door adapter which has a reference to itself. After the timed door adapter is created, what it does is it registers itself with the timer and when the timer sees that it is open for too long, it sends the alarm signal to the timed door adapter back. And the responsibility of the timed door adapter is to notify the timed door that your timeout has finished and you have to close. By this approach, we have not modified the door interface. It still has those two previous methods which were open and close and the timer feature has been implemented by completely adding new code and not modifying the older one. So here, the open closed principle is still not violated. And since we did not add any unusable methods, every subclass is replaceable in place of base class. So Liskov substitution principle is also not violated. And at the end, Interface segregation principle is not violated because no one had to implement unusable methods. And that was the solution via adapter pattern. Let's have a look at the multiple inheritance based solution. In this approach, we will create a new interface which will have the timeout method. It's called the timer service client and the timed door has to implement both the door and the new timer service client interface. This timer service has a reference to the timer itself and can register itself directly and the notification can be done through the timer service client. And in this solution as well, we did not modify existing interface so no class had to add any implementation for any unused methods. Now let's compare the previous two solutions. The second solution is more simple than the first one if our requirement is simple and we don't need any kind of pre or post processing for calls to the time tours. Then we can directly go for this approach. In case we want to have some pre or post processing for time calls, we can choose to keep that responsibility in a separate adapter and only delegate the required calls to the time tour. It really depends on what your requirement is. And so these are the two ways which you can use to not have classes implement methods they do not use. It's time for you now to go back to the first example and think a solution for it. I'll give you a small hint. Try breaking the living thing into smaller interface. And here are some common practice which can help you think you can create 
good interface which don't violate ISP. The first one is have a look at your code and try to figure out clients which tend to use similar kind of methods. For these methods, if you could create an interface which all these client implements, the design would get simpler as it will allow you to group common clients together. The second one is changing interfaces. This is what we saw just in the last example we discussed. Instead of adding a new method to an existing interface, which requires a lot of different classes to change, it's a better idea to make a new class implement a new interface, hence not touching any of the existing interfaces. So next time you're about to change an interface, make sure that you look for the violation of this principle because it might save you a lot of time. And that's all from my side on interface segregation principle and I'll see you in the next video. Hi, in this video, we will discuss the dependency inversion principle. Let's get started with the definition. High level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions and abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstraction. Let's try to understand the first part of the definition. In software engineering, we usually split the application architecture in terms of layers. For example, the UI layer, the controller layer, or the DAO layer, and so on. In this paradigm, high level module depends on low level module to achieve a certain set of functionality. What this part says is that your high level module should not depend on low level modules directly. And this basically translates to the reference code I have shown in the picture. Well, if you see in the picture, I am creating a direct dependency on the low level module by instantiating a concrete class for it. Now, what the first part of the definition says is that you don't create new objects for low level concrete classes in your high level classes. Doing this ties your high level class with their low level counterparts and any change in the low level module starts affecting the high level module. Let's try to understand why this is a problem from a physical perspective, which can give you the same analogy. Let's say your high level module is your operating system and your low level module is the random access memory. Do you think that any change in the RAM should affect how your operating system works? You don't, right? And this works because your operating system is not dependent directly on the exact RAM you're using, but rather it depends on an abstraction, which is the kernel. Just imagine what a nightmarish scenario would that be when you change your RAM and your operating system starts to behave differently. That is the exact same scenario which will happen if you start directly tying your low level module with your high level module. Similarly, for all software projects which are divided into different high level and low level layers, make sure that there is no tight dependency between them as I mentioned. Usually, higher level modules are those modules which are close to the end user and lower level module are very far from the end user. And this is a good way to segregate between the different levels of your code. So instead of depending on the concrete implementation of the class, depend on the abstraction, which are hiding the implementation from the high level modules and only exposing the contract. This process is called inverting the dependency. In the previous slide, you were directly depending on the concrete implementation, and now you are depending on the abstraction instead. That's inverting your dependency. If you look at the example code, it creates an interface I low level module, which is implemented by your low level module. This interface is your abstraction. And if you see in high level module, we are auto wiring this abstraction instead of the concrete low level module. Let's talk about the second part of the definition. Abstraction should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstraction. These are the following heuristics which comprise this part. There should be no variable which holds a pointer reference to a concrete class. No class should derive from a concrete class and no method should override an implemented method in the base class. Well, I find these rules a little funny because how else you will be able to code if you're not even allowed to do the basic things because inserting an abstraction on every call is madness. 
According to me, you should have good abstraction between layers and critical parts of your code. If you start avoiding the new keyword at all point of time, things might become nightmares too soon. So for this, the exception is if the concrete class does not change at all and is completely local to the context, there is no harm to depend on it. So where exactly can you apply dependency inversion? Basically, between any two classes who are calling each other, but again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. What I would suggest is that you identify your layers well and isolate them with each other using dependency inversion. And let me show you how. So here I'm considering a very small example for dependency inversion scenario. We have a button class which is polling for user events and whenever there is a trigger, it invokes lamps turn off or turn on method. So what are the problems with the current example? Button directly depends on the lamp. So there's a clear DIP violation as it should depend on an interface. If there are any changes in the lamp, the button is directly affected and your button cannot be used to turn off or turn on something else which provides a similar functionality since it is heavily coupled with the lamp. Let's try to add an abstraction and see how this helps. So first of all, we have added a button server interface which lamp is implementing to give implementation for the turn on and turn off method and what button server is doing is acting as an abstraction over the lamp so instead of calling the lamp directly now your button is talking to the button server which in turn talks to the lamp so we have added this abstraction and we have fixed the DIP violation. And it ensures that any change in the lamp does not affect the button as long as the turn off and turn on method are working as expected. Also, now if you see, you can easily replace the implementing class for the button server with a motor or a fan or anything which has a similar kind of functionality. And this way, your button class is not directly or tightly coupled to the lamp as it could be reused to turn on and turn off several different objects. And this is the flexibility what dependency inversion principle is trying to give you. It is trying to isolate your higher level modules and lower level modules with each other so that they don't depend on each other in such a way that any change in any of the module affects the module which is above it, which is the button module in this case. Now, if you look at the name for the abstraction we have provided here, it's called button server. Now, just by looking at the name, it feels like this abstraction could only be used with a button, but that's not the case, right? It could be used with anything which has a turn on or turn off fun functionality. So, why name it button server? So let's go and fix this. We will be changing this to a switchable device. And now your abstraction in the name way is also not coupled with a button, which means the abstraction does not depend on the detail. That's it for the dependency inversion principle. I hope you have understood it and you will use it wisely. See you later.